Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Orthodox Morphosis with Stratis Papagiorgiou and... Father Panagiotis Papagiorgiou. And uh, we are here today. We're excited. I'm excited to talk about uh, St. John Chrysostom, whose feast day is today on the new calendar, not here in, not here in Serbia. Uh, okay. And uh, before we begin, I am going to read um, a quote from something from from him that I read online today, and I and I couldn't help but be reminded of the modern world. Now, remember, he lived in the fourth century, three hundreds, and early fifth century, um, and so you know, in a way, you could say that his world was completely different than ours, and yet. <laughs> We run eagerly to, to dances and amusements. We listen with pleasure to the foolishness of singers. We enjoy the foul words of actors for hours without getting bored. And yet when God speaks, we yawn. We scratch ourselves and feel dizzy. Most peoples would run rapidly to the horse track. Although there is no roof there to protect the audience from rain. Even when it rains heavily, or when the wind is lifting everything, they don't mind bad weather, or the cold, or the distance. Nothing keeps them in their homes. When they are about to go to church, however, then the soft rain becomes an obstacle to them. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them who Amos or Obadiah is, or how many prophets or apostles there are, they can't even open their mouths. Yet they can tell you every detail about the horses, the singers, and the actors. What kind of state is this, St. John Chrysostom? <laughs> he was not from our times, but he's so modern mm. uh, because his times were very similar to ours in so many different ways because humanity is humanity and, uh, and lives always tends always rather to those kinds of things that he describes. Yeah. yeah. But also, you know, um, we're, we're talking about a time when uh, the Roman Empire um, is being Christianized. So we're moving from the ancient pagan world to what eventually becomes the Christian Roman Empire, where the church becomes the center of the life of people it has a great effect on them. Oh, this process began with um, uh, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who basically legalized the church for the first time. It allowed them to worship freely. And, um, and then Constantine, bes uh, besides allowing freedom of religion and freedom of worship, which was primarily for the Christians because they were the only ones being persecuted by the Roman uh, pagans before, before him. He also took a lot of the um, principles of life of Christianity and um, put them as laws in, in the Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire that was being developed now. Uh, and, and it was being Christianized in the process of being Christianized. So these are very interesting times for the Roman Empire and uh, St. John Chrysostom comes at the end of a generation which has already gone through this process and, and we can talk about this if you want today's study, we can talk about this because I think a lot of people don't realize uh, how important this period is the fourth century and important in the sense of uh, not only that the Christians are not being persecuted anymore but important because Christianity begins to change the Roman society. And how did it, that happen? And um, what, was the, what was the resistance to that? And uh, what eventually was the outcome of that? We, we should talk about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and, and uh, to, be, to, be, to be clear, I think what people don't realize is how much Christianity actually affected in a positive way the world. Um, the, the very first hospitals were built ever in history, um, like major on a large scale. 
um, and 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 I've even read that 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 the hospital that we have today is based on that early Christian um, quote unquote Byzantine style hospital of general care. Um, the you know place for widows and for orphans and 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 the orphanages and and in Constantinople even. Even even developed the the orphanotrophos, which is the, the the position in the government for the one who is in charge of all all the orphanages, like a, a actual government position, which never existed before Christianity. Yeah. It was everybody for themselves. If you survive in this world, that's great. If you don't, well, you know, tough. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. tough. So, yeah. you know, um, and and. Uh, and I was listening tonight to to uh, the bishop from Veria. I forgot his name. And uh, do you remember Andale, his name? Andale Imone. Andale Imone, I think yeah. so. Yeah. And he was saying how Eleimosini, alms giving, um, you know, you know, he he compared it to how they we've gone to the moon and back, you know, actually physically. And he said, and and he said that for Chrysostomos, giving alms will take you into the heavens, it'll bring you to the moon and it will bring you right back or something like that, <laughs> I can't remember. Um, and, I'm, and I'm generalizing, I'm saying various things because it's all coming to me right now, but I don't think we realize the importance of the fathers of the first 500 years, let's say, in the 600 years, and the immense impact they have had on this world and this planet. Yep. And the various things we take for granted come directly from these giants. Yeah, but, but Chrysostom lives at this um, time when uh, it's a critical moment in the life of the Roman Empire in the sense that um, Christianity begins to take over. It's uh, right at the turn of the century when Theodosius basically embraces the church as the uh, as the religion of the empire, the Christian, Christian. Yeah, he formalizes it. Yeah, he, he makes it formal because uh, Constantine did not do that. Constantine um, favored the church and favored Christianity uh, and uh, allowed them to freely worship, but he never really made it the official religion of the empire. So Theodosius does that. In the meantime, he probably, we have, he, probably, he probably couldn't do it for political reasons. It probably would have been too extreme for him to... Yeah, it was too early to do such a thing because, yeah. yeah. But uh, he made it easier for Christians to, to live and thrive. And, and in spite of all of that, we have a setback, okay? At the time of uh, St. Uh, Basil the Great and St. Gregory the Theologian, uh, middle of the century, we have a setback, which is the the time of Julian, the apostate, the apostate, when, when, uh, who was a friend of theirs and a classmate at the University really? of Athens. And they knew him too. I, well. didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So, so Julian, who was a nephew of uh, Constantine, becomes the emperor. And he reverts back to paganism and he wants to bring back the religion, the old religion. And he, uh, and he renovates the temples that were being now abandoned by, by the pagans who become Christians. And he begins to favor um, the educational method of the pagans going back to only philosophy, no church uh, writings, no biblical texts, no Christian. So he kind of pushes back at Christianity in a very strong way. And, uh, and the great fathers of that time, Basil and Gregory and, and the others who lived at that time, they, they witnessed that. They actually experienced that. So uh, Chrysostom comes at the end of that uh, period when uh, Julian is defeated. Well, he's defeated because he dies in battle fighting the Persians. And, uh, uh, and when, when uh, the arrow hits him and he falls off the horse, uh, Amianus Marcellinus, the historian who, who was apparently close by or he knew people who were uh, with him at the time, uh, Julian uh, in desperation says, you have defeated me, Nazarene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he he ac accepts his defeat. He, he admits his defeat. 
yeah. because he tried Nazar to wipe out the Nazarene, which was Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's actually there's actually a uh, there's a um, um, in the middle of the desert in Persia or somewhere out there in I don't know Armenia or something. There is a, a on the wall of this mountain. There's actually a carving of Julian being defeated by the then Persian king. Yep. Actually, did you yep. know that? It's, uh, no, I didn't know that particular yeah, thing, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it was a it was a great moment for for the Christians of the empire, uh, because after that we have Theodosius and we have the embracing of the of the Christian Church. Um, of course, Julian Julian did something else as well in order to embarrass the Christians. And all of this is written by his uh, uh, historian, who was a pagan historian, Amianus Marcellinus. You can find the book, anybody who wants to find it. It's one of the classics of uh, the early uh, Roman, or the late antique Roman period. So Amianus Marcellinus writes about a, an event that happens in Jerusalem. You see, mm -hmm. Julian understood that the Christians thought that someday um, Christ will come. In glory, and 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 before that happens, the temple in Jerusalem will be built, the the Jewish temple. Okay, so um, so I mean, so Julian, in order to embarrass the Christians, according to Marcellinus, right, uh, Mianus Marcellinus, the historian, in order to embarrass the Christians, he decides to bring a a group of builders and and begin the renovation of the area where the temple was built on Mount Zion and actually built the temple. Mm -hmm. And then when Jesus won't, won't come back again, then he will embarrass the Christians and, and make fun of them. And that was his goal. It was very childish in some ways, but very, because he, theolo he was theologically well educated, yeah. he understood a lot of these things. And he says, let me make fun of them and embarrass them by building the temple. So according to Amianus Marcellinus, the pagan historian, um, he gathers hundreds of workers, many of them were Jewish men, and brings them to Jerusalem for the first time. The Jews were not allowed to come to Jerusalem until this time, and begins wow. the building of the temple. And suddenly, while the workers were working, there's an earthquake. The foundation of that area opens up, fire comes out, the workers fall into it, they die. And uh, he describes this in a very interesting way. And then, of course, Julian is surprised. He is embarrassed himself, stops the process, and stops the project, and quits trying to embarrass the Christians through that one. <laughs> and that didn't, yeah, but when I hear that kind of thing, I'm like, and that didn't convince him? Or... No, that did not convince him. So he continued to persecute the Christians. So when did he die? What year? Do you remember? I don't remember the year, but we can look it up. Yeah, I'm just thinking how how close to Chrysostom is all of that. It's definitely knowledge that everybody knows. Yeah, it's at the beginning of Chrysostom's life. Chrysostom would have been a teenager, perhaps, at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Antioch. In Antioch, yeah. So, and, so uh, the era of paganism comes to complete a complete end. Now, you have to remember that Chrysostom also is trained under a pagan. Uh, teacher, okay, Libanius, who, um, who who remained true to paganism until the end of his life, and uh, and Chrysostom, of course, becomes a Christian at the end of his studies under Libanius, while Libanius was still alive, and Libanius was one of those that were favored by Julian, and uh, but Libanius was amazed with Chrysostom for his skills and his gifts, and his ability and, and his interest in, uh, in philosophy and rhetoric and his ability for rhetoric. And his plan was to make him um, his successor in this seed of teaching of the ancient um, uh, rhetoric and philosophy. <laughs> mm. Mm. But um, at some point, when he realizes that uh, Chrysostom becomes a Christian, he was baptized soon after his, he ended his studies with Libanius. So uh, Libanius uh, lamenting, he says, <coughs> if he wasn't for those Christians, John would have been my successor. 
but they took him away. They stole him away from us. Mm. Yeah. Libanius also um, had great respect for uh, Chrysostom's mother, no, and Thusa. And, um, and he said some very complimentary things about her. Mm. Tell, tell us about Anthusa. Well, Anthusa was a, a Christian. She was married to an, a Roman official, Segundos, who died early in the life of uh, John. And so she basically brought up John by herself. Um, she was very devout, a very devout Christian, a good example for John. And we don't know very much about her. We also think that there might have been a daughter, but mm. but we, she disappears also quite early, which means that um, she might have died early. So John is brought up by himself. And Anthusa gave him the best education she could by placing him under Livanius. But at the same time, Chrysostom was being taught the faith at home. And so between a good mother, a good Christian mother, and a good uh, pagan uh, uh, secular education, Chrysostom becomes a wholesome person. Mm. And uh, he turns to Christianity, gets baptized when he's 18 or 19. And um, after that, he uh, serves the church in, um, Antioch, and uh, and then he decides to go into the mountains nearby, and he basically becomes a monk under some older monastics who lived in the caves uh, on Mount Asclepios, which was across uh, the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the boundary of the city, basically. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so he he, um, he put himself under the uh, tutelage of uh, some monastics who were very um, extreme in, in the way that they lived. And that had an effect on his, and he was very extreme on himself. So that had an effect on his um, health. Oh. He had to return to the city uh, of Antioch where now the bishop made him a deacon and he took over the responsibility of uh, helping the poor and being in charge of the donations for the poor. And he built that system of uh, philanthropy that you were talking about in the city of Antioch during his mm. time, his lifetime, or his time as a deacon before he became yeah. a, a presbyter. And, and he was more dedicated to preaching after he became a presbyter than he was uh, when he was a deacon. Well, yeah, would he would he be able to preach as a deacon? Probably not. Probably not. Basically, at that time, they wouldn't. But because of his gift, it's possible that he was allowed because some of the things that he wrote were during the time that he was a deacon. But there is no, we're not sure that he actually preached those things. He might have just mm -hmm. written them, but never written preached them. them. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as he became a priest, he would preach. A priest. Can you, a priest. Can, you, can you recount what happened with the, the, the riots uh, where they defaced the imperial family and uh, he had to calm the emperor down? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, that, those are very interesting. I don't want to get too deep into them because they're quite complicated, but they're very interesting for us today to see the relationship between um, state and, church. Uh, and, and church and how we need to respect the state uh, and, and obey the laws um, at the same time with no compromise as far as the faith is concerned. So, but at this time, of course, the, the emperor is a Christian. So the, there is a different, it's a different mm -hmm. situation than when the emperor was a pagan. But even that time, the fathers um, would speak about obedience to the authorities um, as long as they didn't force you to change your faith or to abandon your faith, to yeah. deny your faith. Yeah. Um, 
Well, all right. How does he end up in Constantinople? Well, that's an interesting story because um, as being a preacher for like 10 years was an amazing thing in Antioch and hundreds of people would gather and there were situations where he had, he, he preached every day, like in Great Lent, for example, he would preach every day and he would preach for like an hour and people would be standing and at the end they will applaud. And we have uh, indication from his homilies that uh, they're applauding because at the end of the homily, he says, and stop applauding me and then hear what I say. And then you run off to the uh, theater to watch the naked people or you go to the horses to, uh, to bet your money while the poor and the sick are dying and you don't care for them, you know, that kind of thing. So we know that uh, if there's interaction between him and the audience, so <laughs> that is very interesting too. Um, so his fame uh, of being a, a, a great orator reaches Constantinople and the emperor at the time, he hears about it and he wants him to be the next uh, archbishop. So he Who's said, the he, emperor? Uh, it was, um, uh, uh, that's a good Arcadios. question. Hmm? Arcadios. Arcadios, yeah, thank you. Arcadios hears about it. And he um, he sends uh, a special um, envoy with his chariot, with the royal chariot to uh, come and get him and bring him to Constantinople. And of course, he understands that if this were if this was uh, announced and if um, the people found out, people would be rioting in the streets. So he and 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 the possibility also that he might refuse to to accept this. So he's abducted basically from uh, Antioch. So he's asked to get on the chariot and he wants to talk to him. And, uh, and as they go out the city, you know, they never return. And, and in spite of his uh, protestations, uh, <laughs> they head for Constantinople and, and he never returns I mean, to Antioch after that. Wait, wait, so the emperor himself went? Not the emperor, but uh, somebody oh. that the emperor sent. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, it'd be kind of funny. The no, chariot no, no, rolls up, it's the, yeah. the emperor of the known world. <laughs> no, no, no. No. Okay. No. An envoy of the emperor. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he said. Um, yeah, so he's brought to Constantinople, and then uh, he finally accepts the position. He becomes the Archbishop of Constantinople, <clears throat> and he's ordained the month later in January of. Um, I think it was 398, uh, I believe it was the ordination uh, to, um, uh, to Archbishop, to, to Bishop and then Patriarch, of course that noble. <clears throat> so, um, but he continues his preaching there too. And, uh, and he finds a lot of um, uh, um, corruption in the church some bishops, for example, instead of being um, in their diocese, they live in Constantinople and they live luxurious lives, uh, having parties every, you know, every day almost. And uh, Chrysostom begins to try to stop them. So he, he doesn't go to these things. He eats by himself. He's also kind of sickly in his stomach. So he, uh, he eats privately and he studies at night and writes his homilies. Uh, and um, and the bishops get mad at him. He's also critical of, uh, of the way the palace um, and Emperor of Luxia, the wife of Arcadius, he's, uh, <clears throat> uh, he, he's kind of critical about the, the luxury and the uh, opulence of, of the life in the palace. And, and that doesn't go well with the Empress who is, uh, who finally kind of gets together with these bishops that didn't like him, and and in the end he's exiled. You know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. Well, a few things come to mind, yeah. but it's interesting that it's the pa one of the patriarch of Antioch, or not Antioch, Alexandria, um, Alexandria, Alexandria yeah, who who co-orchestrates this. I don't know what he was trying to get out of it. He just didn't like him, I suppose, and. Um, 
there was, there was a story about the, th the three brothers who were supposedly uh, heretical and uh, that Chrysostom accepted them because the noble, they left Alexandria. There is a story about that, the tall brothers, as they're called, uh, who, were, who were accepted by Chrysostom, who wanted to investigate what was happening. Uh, and before he manages to reach a conclusion, Theophilus attacks him. And uh, at the instigation of the Empress, the Synod of Oak is brought together that condemns him. And we end up uh, to be, you know, he ends up in exiled with accusations that didn't make any sense. Like well, eating, and, eating and dithero after receiving Holy Communion, for example, was one of those accusations. It was, it was just a foolish thing. It was something that um, they were not doing officially as we do today. Yeah. So, uh, so they, they accused him of that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there he, were other things too. That's but, such a tiny thing. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I, I love what happens though when they actually try to exile him the first time. What happens? Yes, yes. what happens is something happened in the palace and we don't know what it was. Hmm. We shook up uh, Evoxia and she woke up in the morning or she, you know, she came out of the, her chambers in the morning and she says, bring that John back because something happened to me tonight. It was a dream, it was, uh, she lost the baby. We're not quite sure exactly what it was, but it's something dramatic happened to her that night. And she thought Did maybe it? it was because she exiled John. And so she brought him yeah. back that night. But then a few months later, okay, he, you know, he was, he was taken wasn't out there also, hmm? Wasn't there also a riot? Oh yeah, there were riots, yeah. Yeah. That night when people found out they were rioting. So between the riots and whatever happened to her, uh, she changed her mind. But then again, she went back to where she was. <clears throat> yeah. It, um, it just reminds me how- Something else about Constantinople I wanted to point out is that in Constantinople, he uh, met Olympias, the Digoness, who had her own monastery and orphanage. And she was responsible for feeding uh, the, the orphans and the widows taking care of them. And that friendship with Olympias, the spiritual friendship continues even after the exile because she's also exiled across the river, but uh, she's also exiled from Constantinople. And, and we have a series of exchanges, letters of, uh, of exchange between Chrysostom and Olympias while he's in exile, where they're both in exile, that show that spiritual friendship and the, the spiritual status of both of them as they suffer during this persecution by the empress. Yeah, so because another... they're not writing this for hmm? Because they're not writing this for anybody else. They're writing exactly how they feel. Yeah, right? yeah they're and talking so... to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. So we get to... Other stolen bias have been published in English by SVS. Uh, anybody can find them. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, and, and he ends up in... Uh, uh, where the where Armenia is, the mountains of Armenia in East Anatolia, and uh, and eventually, and he's brought from place to place in the middle of the winter. You know, I mean, even in the middle of the winter, but uh, the weather is very difficult up there, and uh, his health is breaking up. And finally, during one of the moves that he's moved from a place one place to another. Um, he gets very sick and he dies in the church in a small chapel uh, where uh, he found himself at that time. The soldiers allowed him to rest. And uh, at the, um, his last words were, Loxa to Theopandon and again, glory be to God for all things. Which is really amazing considering what he suffered and how much pain he had at that time. So, uh, we have, um, I have in my library about 40 volumes, 40, 40 something volumes of his writings. He was a prolific writer. Uh, his sermons are an hour long. Uh, most of them were taken down by uh, shorthand uh, writers and, and, and then he would probably embellish them and finish them and complete them. And what we have today 
is amazing uh, sermons and explanations of biblical texts um, that have great depth and they're very close to the text and uh, inspired by faith and inspired by um, uh, Christ and the Holy Spirit. So, and I know that what you have, the little icon you have uh, for our podcasts, it's St. Paul speaking to him. Uh, there is a story about that. When he was interpreting the letters of St. Paul, um, during the time when he was writing his sermons, he was in interpreting the letters of St. Paul. He's in Constantinople, and his deacon, who was in the end, St. Cassian, the Roman, okay, he ended up in, in Rome, and he, he becomes St. Cassian. He was his deacon. He was a monk and deacon in Constantinople at the time. And he would check on him because he was kind of sickly. And uh, you know how the, the old doors had these big holes with the big keys to turn the, the, the lock. Mm -hmm. So the deacon would look through the hole of the lock to see what the archbishop was doing. And he would see St. Paul standing over him and whispering in his ear. And modern historians and modern um, uh, theologians who analyze the homilies and and uh, talk about how uh, how he was interpreting certain texts, they consider, especially the the homilies on Romans, which I have uh, translated and and published the first volume. Um, modern theologians talk about the fact that uh, Chrysostom is the closest to Saint Paul than anybody who. Uh, interpreted St. Paul's letters. And when I read that and I read the story, I was really amazed how uh, the story of St. Paul whispering in his ear the interpretation of his own homilies uh, has come to be and um, how close uh, St. John Chrysostom is to St. Paul in his interpretations. Okay. Mm. So, so I end up on Mount Athos at some point in the 90s with a group of uh, pilgrims. And we, we finally got, got to the monastery of uh, Vadobevi. And the tradition in the monasteries of Mount Athos is <clears throat> after Vesperos every night, they open the relics of saints for the pilgrims to venerate. So the priest <clears throat> who was opening the relics for us that night, Father George was his name. He's still there at Vatubedi. He, um, <clears throat> he explained what relics they had. And there was the head of St. John Chrysostom. They actually have his complete skull. But it's not completely um, corrupted. So you could see the skin on the top. And, uh, and, the, and the priest points to his left ear how his left ear is intact. And you know, when you bury somebody, the first things that go that basically get corrupted and deteriorate are the... Uh, the cartilage. The cartilage, yeah. And the, ear, the ears usually disappear quickly once you bury somebody. Well... The ears and the nose. And the nose, yeah. Chrysostom's left ear is intact with the skin over his head, connected. And, uh, and I'm standing in front of it. And I looked at Father George and I said, Father George, that's the ear that St. Paul whispered in as he explained uh, to St. John Chrysostom how to uh, interpret his writings. And, and uh, Father George, the monk, looked back at me and said, how did you know that? <laughs> he knew the story too. <laughs> So I said, I know the story. <laughs> he says, I do too. Uh, and uh, we had a very amazing moment at that point as it was a big revelation at that moment of uh, what happened with the ear of St. Chrysostom that is preserved after 16, 1700 years. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and that we are witnesses to that amazing miracle of whatever that was, okay? 
So that's that was a, a major point of connection with me with Saint John Chrysostom that day. Yeah, and 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 also, <clears throat> you, what other connection? I mean, you did your uh, thesis, your dissertation on Saint John Chrysostom, right? Yes, yes, my my doctor my doctoral dissertation was on John Chrysostom. He was a and I and I, that's when I learned a lot about him and about his theology because my dissertation was a theological analysis of uh, the major themes, the theological themes in the homilies on Romans, the thirty-two homilies on Romans by Saint John Chrysostom. So um, basically, my dissertation um, lifts out of the homilies the the themes, the common themes that. Um, run through these homilies, the theological themes. And, and this was an answer to, my dissertation was an answer to a lot of uh, uh, modern scholars who were saying that um, uh, Chrysostom is not a theologian, he's just a preacher, he's a moralist. And I show in this dissertation that he's a lot more than a, a moralist and a, uh, and a preacher. He is a great theologian because um, he has managed at the end of the fourth century after the era of the great fathers, Athanasius and Basil and Gregory the Theologian and Gregory of Nyssa, Christo brings together all the theology and applies it in a practical way to the life of the people of the time. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to Christianize the society uh, by teaching them how to live their lives according, according to the gospel uh, based on um, his understanding that he inherits from the great fathers before him, and his understanding that he experiences through his uh, uh, monastic life that he experienced on Mount Asclepios um, in Antioch in his early years, and subsequently his own life in worship and in preaching and in interpretation of the scriptures, which uh, he spends the rest of his life doing. Um, so he is a link between the ancient world and the modern world as we know it today. And he is very sensitive to what is happening in society. And his main goal is to help society to become better, to become Christian, to become moral, uh, to accept the truths of Christ and the truths of the Christian faith. And um, he's, he dedicates his life to that and he dies for it as he's mm. punished by his peers for being mm. such a uh, dedicated man. And that's really what happened. Yeah, I, I think uh, in the thing I was listening to earlier, what's amazing is that, you know, um, he's, he has a very brief uh, tenure, at, tenure as a patriarch. And yet he's probably the most celebrated maybe most celebrated saint, you know, beyond the apostles. Um, well, we, we celebrate celebrated the, hierarch. We celebrate the, the liturgy that that he affected and that he used in his life, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, we celebrate every time throughout the year, um, except for 10 Sundays uh, or 10, yeah, 10, yeah. 10 times, well, which we do the liturgy of uh, Osem Basil. The rest of the Sundays and yeah. feast days, we celebrate uh, uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, and his name is always mentioned in every yeah, so, liturgy. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, he's 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 the one we we quote at the end of of Pascha. And yeah, we yes, we um, read his homily on um, uh, the Pascha homily, as we call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what it, what inspired you? This is turning into an interview. What inspired you to originally make him your focus? Um, it was <clears throat> as I was uh, doing my doctoral studies when I was still taking classes. I came across the issue of original sin, mm. <laughs> and um, and because. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was done at Catholic University. We uh, had to take a lot of Latin, an intensive course in Latin, a series of courses in Latin. And I was able to read uh, Augustine as well. And of course I could read the Chrysostom, I read Chrysostom all the time. 
So I came, uh, I came across the fact that uh, Chrysostom had a different approach, or Augustine had a different approach to original sin than, uh, than Chrysostom did. And so I, I studied that more deeply and I published a, I wrote a midterm paper that turned into a publishable paper that I published at the, the St. Vladimir's uh, Theological Quarterly, uh, which is a comparison between Chrysostom and Augustine on original sin. Um, so that really inspired me to look further into Chrysostom. So I also came across the homilies on Romans that um, uh, I understood that they were probably the most theological homilies of Chrysostom. So I started reading and studying and, and I realized how, what a treasure Chrysostom is, uh, theological treasure, as well as um, Practical amazing, life. Hmm? Practical life. Uh... Practical life, yeah, application to practical life. Uh, he takes theology, high theology and puts it in practice and tries to explain it to people and, and convince them, tries to convince them to live this Christian life, which is Im imbued with theology, high theology, which they cannot understand. So that's what he does. And, and so I came across the homilies, I came across the comparison, and that really kind of set me on that course. And I started reading more about him and, and his writings. And then the, the, the homilies of Romans became my focus. And so the dissertation came out of that, yeah. Hmm. And I've, I've never regret, not only the regret, I think I was enriched by it. And my ministry yeah. as a priest was enriched by it. And, uh, and my, he inspired me also to be a priest dedicated to God. So I tried to, to do as much as I can on that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, op the, 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 the picture of our, of our podcast, the, the, the icon that we use, um, is it's the, the name of the podcast is Morph Orth Orthodox Morphosis, which means Orthodox education. And I, I, I was thinking like, what, what could we use that would sort of symbol like through an icon that would, you know, that would, would show in the best how the Orthodox are educated. <laughs> And 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 I and I remembered the story, of course, and I thought, what what better example of education than being educated directly by the saints, <laughs> yeah. and not yeah. just not just any saints, but the apostles themselves. So, um, yep. I said that has to be the, that has to be the picture. That has to be the yeah. picture. Well, orthodoxy. Uh, one of his characteristics is that he returns continually back to the apostles and back to the fathers of the early church. And if anybody deviates from that, of course, he's not orthodox. So we, we always try to do that. And whenever orthodoxy is corrected, it is corrected because we go back uh, to the early church. And one of the major things that I feel I like contributed a little something was this thing about original sin, which I discovered um, the difference between Augustine and, and Chrysostom. And then I, I discovered that uh, the West has taken Augustine's position, which is different from the early church. And, um, and anybody who's interested, we'll send them the paper. We can send them the paper, they can read on their own and see, and they can read, they can read more and find out more if they want to. But um, the, uh, the only way to correct wrong teachings of later times is to always go back to the patristic times and see what the father said, starting with the apostles and St. Paul and all the other things and the, and the gospels, and then see what the early fathers said, especially the fathers of the fourth and fifth centuries who are closer uh, to Christ and the apostles than we ever will be. And then from that, you um, uh, will you be able to understand what the proper teaching of the church should be okay and that's for me that's the motto and that's the way to do it and the church has always done that every time there's a controversy they go the fathers of the church have always have always gone back to the scriptures and to the earlier fathers before them the earlier theologians and uh, and always the earliest and of course making adjustments for the passage of time and the and the changes in society and understanding historically and theologically 
how things should be and how things uh, can be today. Yeah, and I think this kind of takes us into another area, but I think sometimes when we say the fathers, uh, we don't quite know who we're talking about. We think of the modern fathers living on Mount Athos. We say the fathers, pateres is in Greek. We, we, you know, it's a very uh, ambiguous sort of uh, meaning. But I've learned from you that when we say the fathers of the church, we mean essentially the men that are put inside the altar on the wall of the, of the back of the altar underneath the <laughs> that's right the that's right, <laughs> the, that's right. The... <laughs> the fathers of the church of course we call the elders that live in monathos or in monasteries we call them fathers and uh, and we call them elders but uh, the fathers of the church with a capital f fathers are the great saints of the church who have left us a legacy of faith, deep faith and deep theology. And they were confronted uh, by heresies and they were able to uh, do amazing interpretations of the scriptures and kind of help us to reach conclusions and help the ecumenical councils to reach conclusions. So Athanasius is a great father and he's called Athanasius the Great because his contribution uh, after the during the first uh, ecumenical council when he was a young man, but also afterwards in the fight against Arianism was uh, very uh, important and, and, and had a great uh, impact on the church of the time and the conclusion of what happened at the time. And uh, yeah, and he's in the, 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 uh, his writing on the incarnation, for example, is a classic of uh, classic theological writing that we use to this day and every theologian has to read it and understand it and see why we talk about Christ the way we talk about him and as the incarnate logos and uh, all these other things and then uh, send, send bases on the Holy Spirit and the and the writings of um, St. Gregory the Theologian the five homilies that were used in the Second Ecumenical Council those are important documents that make these fathers great in the sense of their effect on the outcome of the ecumenical councils. They're inspired by God, they were inspired by God and they, um, uh, they were not just intellectually brilliant but they were also spiritually uh, connected with God and God worked through them to correct the errors that were in society at the time. So we need people like that and we need people like Father Paisius, who was not an educated man, and yet his life, based on the life of the previous generations of fathers, like mm. Chrysostom and the others, he was able to give us a legacy to follow. Mm. Same thing with uh, Porfirios, for example. His legacy does not come from a great education and brilliance and great sermons. Um, he's not known for his great sermons, but he's no, known for his gifts of the Holy Spirit that God gave him even as an uneducated man who never even finished elementary school. Mm. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. He becomes a father mm. of the church eventually uh, as his life shines the life of Christ and the uncreated light into the world uh, through mm. the gifts that God gives him. And that's what makes him a father of the church, not just yeah. because he lives on a mountain somewhere far away from other people. Right. He actually lived in Athens, Porfirio, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, beside, be, be, I mean, besides his, or in spite of his desire to be on Mount Athos, he, he was forced to, to live in Athens all those years. Yeah. And yet, because his heart was turned to God, he was able to receive the gifts of God and, uh, and be a saint Porfirio today. Mm. Yes. I think we need to come right. to the conclusion of this podcast. Yes, well, I think I think the conclusion speaks for itself. I, I want to, if you're okay with it, to go over to some questions that we have um, in the Discord server. For the next one, I'm going to tr I'm going to try and get the questions from uh, from um, uh, from elsewhere. Okay. Um, hang on, one moment. All right. 
So So Father, Trisayan Films makes a lot of great videos about all of our saints, some more distant from us than others. I tend to find it hard to connect with the saints from the early church because they just seem so far away from us. How does one come to view these older saints as embodying a living tradition instead of a great of great people stuck in the past? Well, I think that God has blessed us in, in the 20th and 21st century with people who embody the life and faith of the ancient fathers and who show us how you can live in this world and be uh, dedicated to God. And you would think that um, uh, in spite of the, um, the, different, um, the different world that people think it's a different world today, uh, we, have, we have people who are willing to live the life of St. Chrysostom and the life of uh, uh, St. Athanasius and, and correct the world with their lifestyle and their, and their own faith. So I think when we don't need to go to the ancient times to find people to inspire us. We need to look at the ones who God has given us in our days. Okay, Porfirios and Basius and Nectarios that we celebrated the other day. I mean, think of Nectarios, you know, how, how much he suffered. So did, uh, so did Chrysostom, but Nectarios is in the 20th century. Okay, and he suffered from his peers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and his humility and his dedication to God and his, his unwavering faith is what we need to follow. It's not uh, uh, anything, you know, intellectual and, and, and knowledge and things like that. It's simple stuff, which is uh, the intellectual is for the, is for the intellectuals. But you know, today in our society, a lot of intellectuals are leaving Christianity because Christianity is mystical, yeah. mm. primarily. So if you lose the mysticism, you lose Christianity. So that would be my answer to that is uh, look close and don't go too far. Mm. All right. Hello, Father. What is a good way to learn biblical theology from the Orthodox perspective of tradition and scripture? Um, biblical theology in an Orthodox way would be given to you by somebody who has immersed himself or herself in, uh, in the theology of the church and the patristic interpretations of the scriptures. So uh, you can do it on your own if you want, but um, it's, it's not simple, it's vast, you can get lost. Um, I think that <clears throat> today for uh, English speakers, we have more books and more um, uh, translations of originals, original texts than ever before. When I became a priest or when I was in the seminary, there were very few books that I could buy in English to read about Orthodox theology or uh, Orthodox uh, interpretation of scriptures. Today, there is an abundance. There is more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a good um, service to the church, the English speaking church was done by the creation of the uh, Orthodox study Bible, mm -hmm. where the footnotes are uh, pulled out of the patristic writings and, um, and the patristic perspectives are given uh, for anyone who is a, uh, you know, a, a, a studious person who wants to delve deeply into uh, all these things. So look into that and see how much you can find. Uh, get the Orthodox study Bible and use it as you study the Bible. And then if you have questions, go to someone who has studied further than you have and get their input as well. Um, it says here two questions. Is there a recommendation? Is there a recommended order of reading the patristics? And if so, what should be the first? I only have the budget for one book at the moment. Also, how important is it to read patristics, especially considering I'm not even close to finishing the Bible? I, I think you've kind of answered it. 
Well, but um, I would suggest I would suggest for someone who wants to read the, the early patristic writings, uh, what we call the Apostolic Fathers, and uh, read the epistles of uh, uh, Saint Ignatius, for example. Uh, read the Didache. Uh, start with those things, the very simple early uh, witnesses, because those people are the closest to the Bible than the rest of the patristic fathers, mm -hmm. the fathers of that we call mm -hmm. fathers. Yeah. So um, from there, mm -hmm. uh, you can read just in the martyr and, uh, and mm -hmm. slowly move in. But go to the apostolic fathers first and the Didache. And there is a book. There, there are editions of books that have all of this together. Uh, you can find something that has everything together. Mm -hmm. And if you speak Greek, it's good to read the Greek text as well. So you may want to find something that has the Greek text because that will help you a lot. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, uh, Theodore writes, Father, what are your top three or five tips for catechumens? Uh, it depends where they come from, OK? Um, if a catechumen comes from Roman Catholicism, I will advise them to leave behind legalism. There's a lot of legalism in Roman Catholicism and authoritarianism that um, mm. the people learn to live within an authoritarian system and they don't think for themselves and they're not able to uh, get out of the box. They need, you need to get out of the box. Orthodoxy has freedom. Uh, and legalism, okay, also preve prevents freedom. So you need to get out of that. If you come from Protestantism, you need to give up uh, the, the Protestant principles yeah. of uh, Bible alone and faith alone and all these other things, because um, those things are obstacles. And you need to read and understand history, early history of the church and where the scriptures came from and uh, how the early fathers understood the scriptures. So I would say those basic things. But of course, follow your catechist, whoever it might be, uh, probably a priest who has studied these things, who will help you and focus on history, learn the early church history and understand the development of the church so that you can understand where we are today and why we are where we are today. Um, history defines us and defines who we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Father, how does one deal? Hmm? Let's close with one more, perhaps, but we need to close. Okay. It. Well, I mean, this last one says, uh, how do you, how does one deal with despondency? This sounds like a whole topic in and in and of itself. That's a big topic. Despondency. Uh, especially in our times now with coronavirus and shutdowns and a lot of people go through that. Despondency might have um, uh, some, some level of depression involved in it, uh, not necessarily clinical depression, but whatever it may be, the situational uh, depression. Um, so I, I don't have a recipe for it exactly, but I think that you need to talk to a spiritual father. You need to un unravel what's happening to you and, um, and uh, prayer, attending the divine liturgy and Vesper service, North service um, and receiving Holy Communion will elevate you uh, spiritually to get out of that situation uh, quickly. If you don't address it that way, of course it continues because you are isolated, you are uh, depressed and, 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 you can't, and, and you live in that state forever. So you need to come out of that state and uh, utilize what the church has put out, the services, the worship services, Vesperos, Orthros, Divine Liturgy, uh, which we celebrate continually uh, to and bring yourself to church to attend. And then you need to go to a priest and confess and get some advice and help yourself with that. All right, let's. Uh, that was great. I, uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, we will see you all next time. Any any last words? Oh, may God bless everybody. And um, I know that the threat of the coronavirus is increasing. Take care of yourselves. Uh, don't listen to rumors and 
uh, all kinds of false false news. Focus focus on on your faith. Focus on God, and uh, trust in God that He will get us out of this. And pray that God will protect you and protect us all, and help those who are uh, fighting the at the front line, helping people to have the strength and the ability to help people. So God bless you and protect you all. And thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you.